Hi, this is Carla Sutter, Director of Operations of Synergy Home Care, and I'm excited to be able to present today on successfully planning and achieving short and long-term goals. So this conversation is going to be all about planning goals, talking about short and long-term goals. And as the agenda on the next slide will discuss, we're going to go through several aspects. We're going to talk about definitions. We're going to talk about goal setting. We're going to talk about goals versus dreams. I'm going to share some information about failure and successes of goal setting, the types of goals that there are, and the power of setting goals will be discussed throughout. So let's talk about what the definition of goals really are. According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, a goal is an object of a person's ambition or effort, an aim or desired result. For example, going to law school has become the most important goal in his life. We sometimes think about these as objectives, as an aim, as our end target, as our intention, as our plan, as our purpose, all of which have the same type of definition. So what is a goal for us? Perhaps it's a desired result or outcome that a person or a system envisions and plans to and commits to achieving. So as we discuss this today, this may not just be about individual goal planning, but you may be looking at this based on your business, based on a system that you're working with, thinking about how a family is putting together a set of goals, how a team is working together to achieve a goal. So you may have all some very different perspectives going into this as what you are trying to learn and take from this and how you are going to use it. So there's been some really interesting study um, under Harvard's MBA program and uh, their graduates. And what was interesting is that this study has been done over many different years and with a, uh, different groups of uh, graduates with very similar results. So what they showed was that they, they surveyed this group of uh, students and 84% of these graduates had no specific goals. Now remember, we're talking about those who are attending Harvard MBA program. So these are fairly accomplished individuals in their own right. Um, but even for them, 84% had no specific goal that they had set um, for what they were going to do after graduation. Now, 13% of them had goals, but they didn't write them down. So they had them in their mind's eye, but there was nothing that they had clarified in any type of writing. 3% had very clear and written goals. 10 years later, they went back and they, they interviewed those graduates. The 13% who had goals but who hadn't put them down in, in any kind of formalized way were earning on average twice as much as the 84% that didn't have goals at all. And the 3% that had written goals were earning on average as 10 times as much as the other 97% of the graduates. So some really interesting kind of thoughts come from this when you think about not only who's not setting goals, but then how and what we're doing with the goals that we are setting. As we move through these slides, I thought it was really um, kind of apropos that we have some goals for, for our audience as to doing something with this. So as you move through these slides, think about the short or long-term goals that you've set for yourself. Maybe you have something in mind or that you've had something maybe since January when, you know, we often set goals for ourselves. And this was going to help spur you on to actually moving forward with this goal. My hope is that you're going to consider the information you're learning throughout these slides. Does it change your goal? Is it changing the steps that you're going to take to achieving your goal? And, and hopefully, again, that as you get to the end of these slides and have the, the time to think about them, that maybe something different is going to occur in what you're doing with uh, the goals that you had set or the reason that you began to attend this webinar to begin with.
I'm a big believer that it's important to know what something is, but as important to know what something is not. And what goals are not are dreams, and they're not wishes. Um, Although dreams and wishes and goals are often confused with each other, and we often use that language interchangeably. But dreams and wishes are simply desires. And desires on their own are weak. However, when we combine them with direction, with determination, with dedication, with discipline, and with deadlines, they do strengthen. So when we think about it that way, goals are dreams with a deadline and an action plan. The other unique thing to really think about is that goals can be worthy or unworthy. Individually or as a group, We define their worth, but others may look at them and not see them for the worth that you do. And we're going to talk about that later on in terms of how individually we may look at something and how others may be driving um, the goals that are being set. But goals don't have an intrinsic value to them um, in relation to something else. So these are how we define worth. Now, there's different types of goals, and we're going to focus on two types of goals. The first is short-term goals. So these are goals which can be accomplished in the near future. And typically, we're talking about weeks or months. It's maybe losing two pounds. It may be saving a small amount of money versus saving your entire retirement uh, plan. It may be breaking a bad habit that you've started. It may be stopping to smoke or getting to bed earlier, brushing your teeth every night, those little things and short-term. Long-term goals, though, are much more far-reaching. So while a short-term goal is losing a few pounds, a long-term goal could be losing 50 pounds. It may be getting into college. It may be finding work in a specific field. Sometimes your short-term goal is designed to lead to the long-term goal. And you can really think about this as an enabling goal. It's really a short-term goal that becomes your bridge goal to the long-term. For example, if you're trying to get into an Ivy League school, your enabling goals would be getting a 30 on the ACT, joining at least two after-school clubs, probably doing two to five hours of homework each night, So there are short-term goals that often are tied and connected to a long-term goal, or sometimes short-term goals just live on their own. Um, And and once they're completed, they're completed and, and do nothing else but have gotten you to that end result. So I have another action item for you to be thinking of. Here's a goal setting worksheet. And on the left-hand side, the red is all about short-term goals. What's something you want to accomplish today, this week, this month, even in the next six months? Those, again, would be your short-term goals. What's something you want to accomplish in the next year, in the next five years, in the next 10 years? Those, again, are going to be your long-term goals. And so this is an activity for you to do, and it's something to then come back to as you think about how close you are to achieving some of these and from these, making some very actionable items. It's important to remember when we're thinking about planning for short and long-term goals that there are things in life that we can influence, there are things in life that we can control, but there are also things that we cannot control. And it's important to think about this so that as we move forward with designing the goals that we have, is do they fall into the area of I cannot control this? Because then you're going to be putting your time, your resources, your energy into something that you really probably are not going to be able to achieve. And that sense of failure then is, is going to impact you moving forward with other goal setting, but really had you identified it at the beginning, you wouldn't have attempted it. So we have to think about goal setting in realistic versus unrealistic terms. Is the goal that you're setting really that unicorn? 
that there's very little likelihood that you are going to achieve it as there is very little likelihood we will find one of these in our lifetime. When we set unrealistic goals, these can lead us to feeling like a failure. And additionally, they will make it less likely that we will want to set new goals for ourselves moving forward. So what makes a goal unrealistic? It may be untimely. The time that we are trying to achieve something may have so many other influences happening that there's no way that we're going to be able to put this into motion. It may require unavailable resources that we do not have and can't obtain even in in the short-term means. Or it may be too general in scope. When we talk about, I want to lose weight, but we don't have any set of how much that means, then we're trying to achieve a goal that's really not identified. And when do we feel like we've reached it? And when do we feel like we still have to move forward and work harder on it? This should not be a surprise slide to anyone because most of you have heard the idea of SMART goals. These are specific, they're measurable, they're achievable, they're relevant, and they're timed. So a specific goal, again, is going to be something that is, I want to lose two pounds within the next 30 days. It's measurable because you've set something that you're going to be able to match it to. It's achievable because you're not saying that you are going to lose 100 pounds in in 30 days, which is is very highly unlikely and, and would require medical intervention. It's relevant relevant hopefully in your life again you're you don't want to set a goal that would not be relevant either you don't physically need to lose that weight you have something else going on physically at the same time or medically that makes this not the right time to do this and it's not relevant to you and it's timed so again is this the right time Oftentimes, if we set this goal for ourselves, is it that we are doing this the week before Thanksgiving, and then we also have 20 people coming over to our house and everybody's going to be bringing food, is that a timely goal? And is the likelihood that we're going to be able to achieve that first week of diet planning during that time is probably unlikely. Now, maybe you're challenging yourself and and saying, if I can do it during some of the hardest times of the year, then I'm going to be able to stay with it. But that's going to have to then require a whole other set of actionable next steps. Motivation for setting goals. The definition of motivation is the reason or reasons one has for acting or behaving in a certain way or the desire or willingness of someone to do something. When it comes to goal setting, motivation is a little bit like the chicken or the egg. Without motivation, it's difficult to set and obtain clear goals. But without clear goals, it's easy to go between what you want versus what others see and what you need to do. So we have to understand motivation to be able to do this. But again, it goes back and forth between which one comes first. So here's another homework assignment. To help you define goals and determine who is driving the goal, ask yourself the following questions. What are my thoughts on this goal? What do I want to achieve? What do I want to do? What do I want to um, get to? And why am I wanting to do this? If these questions can't be answered by you or someone else's voice, quote unquote, is driving them, then the motivation is not internal and the goal will be difficult to impossible to accomplish. And that's where that motivation, who is motivating the action to get to this goal. So let's talk about some definitions with this. There's something called intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. 
So intrinsic motivation is the drive within you personally to accomplish a goal. Maybe it's a drive within your company to accomplish this. And you've chosen the goal because it has personal meaning for you and brings you pleasure or satisfaction. Extrinsic motivation is the drive that comes from either someone else, an external demand. So in, in if we think about goals set by companies, is this because you, the company wants to do this or is this because others in the industry are doing it and it makes sense at this time? Extrinsic motivation is also comes from obligation to others, to the society at large, or another stimulus. It is much more difficult to accomplish goals when it's coming from outside motivation. So for instance, if I'm motivated to run because I love the exhilaration I feel after it, that is intrinsic motivation. If I'm running because I'm being chased by a bear, that's extrinsic motivation. The likelihood, if I get away from the bear, that I'm going to continue to be motivated to run and that people are going to find me running on a, on a regular basis is probably low because the only reason I began running was because of that extrinsic motivation. There was a stimulus, i.e. the bear, that caused it. Where is the control for reaching these goals coming from as well? So there's internal and external. So again, you can see that there is, is seeming to be a pattern with this in terms of um, extrinsic and intrinsic and now internal and external locus of control. So someone who has an internal locus of control is one who places responsibility on themselves and feels that they have control over events in their life. It allows someone to believe that we ourselves create and control things in our lives and that we can change them for the better. Someone who really lives as with external locus of control is someone who places responsibility on others and that they feel that events are beyond their control and what happens to them is because of these outside influences. So really think about as your next action item, which do you dis think describes your own sense of control? Do you feel that things happen to you or that you happen to those things? And that's really important. And, and it's, it's not that if you have an external locus of control, things can't get achieved, but you have to be able to look at it because it's going to change how you begin to put down goals and how you expect the outcome to come from. So detours, roadblocks, road closures. We are surrounded by these in our lives and we're surrounded by these when it comes to goal planning. Roadblocks to our goals can be broken down into, here we go again, that internal and external thinking um, of barriers. Internal roadblocks are those we create for ourselves. Bad habits, poor time management, lack of self-esteem, negative thinking. External barriers are ones that come from an outside source. Other people becoming sick, losing funding. So things that we thought were going well in terms of how we were executing on our goals can be impacted and influenced by these. External barriers can become internal barriers. So again, it can change when we become sick. We may, for a period of time, um, have no energy, um, become depressed, become more anxious. And, and those then create own, their own roadblocks internally for what's happening. So as an action item, think about how you manage roadblocks in your life. So if you really think about a roadblock and you're, you're driving, do you sit and wait for it to clear up? Do you take the detour, even if it adds time and miles to your trip? Or are you someone that's planned ahead for it, seen that a roadblock is coming, and avoid it altogether and take a whole different route? Think about this in your day-to-day -day life. The more you understand how you behave, the more you understand how in, in daily living you 
kind of follow through on things. You do your own planning, how your work goes, how you work with others is really going to influence much greater than we often think in terms of how we are planning for our goal setting. It's also important that we align our goals to our mission. You know, most of us are very familiar with mission statements having to do with businesses. And very few of us think about having a personal mission statement. And really, we are, have a greater capability of achieving goals when we base them on a mission statement. When you can understand the stated objective, then it's easier to set and achieve the goals. Mission statements, particularly if they're going to be personal, need to be simple and clear. They should be honest and authentic, and they should be obvious and, and make their presence known. So I'll give you an example. I worked with a, a friend whose goal was to kind of reorganize her office and get it all cleaned up. She had been a photographer, was a photographer for, for many years, um, and her office was becoming so cluttered that she felt that her business capability was being impacted by it. And we first sat down and began to go through the office, and she was really struggling to get rid of anything. Um, she had lots of reasons for not getting rid of paper, not getting rid of old negatives from 20 years ago, from, from photos she had taken of, of families and, and weddings, um, and who had never come back to her asking for these. But she couldn't get rid of anything, even though her goal was to clean up and clear up her office. So what we did was I had her write a mission statement about what it was that was important to her in her life and for her family. And once she had developed that mission statement, we then went back to the same tasks we were doing, the same goal, which was to clean up her, her office. And everything we looked at in the office, every paper we picked up, every old negative we had, every item that was there, she had to make a decision based on the mission statement whether it stayed or went. And it very quickly allowed her to judge all of those items that were cluttering up that office in a very different way than she had before. Even though she had the same goal, which was to clean it up, but this mission statement really allowed her to accomplish something very differently because it narrowed her focus. It allowed her to see clearly what was most important to her even though the goal itself was important, the mission statement drove that home in a very um, unique way. In, in doing some research for this, um, I came upon um, some discussion around uh, Goldilocks uh, theory of goal setting. And, and I, I thought it was very um, interesting and, and really kind of clever and certainly uh, would remain top of mind for people to think about goal setting in this way. If, if a goal is too big, it can become overwhelming and we won't finish it or accomplish it. But if a goal is too small, we may not be motivated to complete it because it doesn't have enough value for the time we've spent pursuing it. So let's think about retirement savings. If I start saving for retirement at age 60 and I want to retire at age 70 and my, my goal is, you know, a million dollars, but I'm not earning the kind of money that would allow me to put away um, enough each month to make it to that, even if I could get into the best stock fund ever, um, I'm going to pretty much start falling back on this can't be done, I can't accomplish it. It's just too big. In Goldilocks terms, the porridge is too hot. But if my goal is too small, if I say I want to retire in the next 10 years and I'm going to save $10,000, which probably over 10 years is, is too small of a goal, isn't going to probably allow me to retire in, in any meaningful way that I want to do the things that I want to do, that goal, like some of uh, Goldilocks porridge, is too small. 
So the trick is to find the goal that's just right. And it goes back to thinking about SMART goals, being specific, being measurable, being timely, having the resources in place that we need, um, and, and really knowing what the scope of that is and how it fits for where we're at. And that's not to say that we set goals that are, again, it's really looking at it from all angles and being realistic with our resources, our time, our energy as to what can be accomplished. It doesn't mean we don't push the envelope a little bit, but it also means we don't put something in place that is so unrealistic unless we were to win the lottery at the same time. And, and we can't trust on that and, and bank on that clearly um, that that's not part of uh, goal setting. You know, doing something like winning the lottery is not a good part of uh, one's goal setting because we have no control over it. It goes back to that whole sense of control, what we can control, what we can influence. So how do you set off on the right foot in terms of successfully planning and achieving goals? Well, as our Harvard MBA graduates certainly found, it's, talk, it's all about making a list. Writing a goal down with the steps to accomplish it will increase our chances of success tenfold, as it did for those Harvard MBA grads. It's keeping a clean mind as well as a clean workspace. Clutter impacts our environment and our minds. And if we have too many items that we have to kind of, quote, move out of our way, whether it's physically move them out of our way or kind of move some of the other thinking that we have going on, or we have too many goals in our head that we're trying to achieve, they are going to clutter us down. They're going to create obstacles to navigate, and we're going to lose focus and, and water it down to a point that we're not going to achieve anything. We need to minimize distractions. These can be voluntary and involuntary. We need to consider why you're shifting from your stated goal and is it because you need to rework your plan or because you're not achieving it that you are self-sabotaging? So oftentimes we then, we have a set plan in place, but shiny objects get in our way and we begin to think, well, maybe I should do this instead, or maybe this is the goal I should do, or this is the action item I should take. So it's really making sure that if we're shifting gears, if we're changing direction on one of our goals, that we have an understanding of why. We need to be balanced. We need to create a timetable and set enough time to accomplish it. Two months may be enough time to set a goal to complete a 3K, particularly if you haven't done any running in the, in the past or for a while. But for most, it's not enough to train for a marathon. So we have to balance the goal with, again, the resources and the timetable we have. This is a hard one for a lot of people. We have to become comfortable with failure. Goal setting doesn't always run smooth. We may hit obstacles. We may hit external barriers and roadblocks. And we learn, need to learn to acknowledge these, learn from them, and, and kind of come back around. We also don't want to keep it a secret. Accountability helps us achieve. First of all, others may want to collaborate with you. And they may have suggestions that will actually allow you to achieve even more. We know that if we have a gym buddy that goes with us to the gym or you have to be accountable and write down everything you're spending um, when you're trying to save money, it makes it a lot harder to rationalize things in our own head when we have to put it out to either somebody else or again on paper. So get help. No one said that goals have to be achieved in solitary confinement. Asking others for help does not diminish the success that you're achieving by reaching your goal and may actually help ensure it. Visualize. Don't lose sight of the end goal. Closing your eyes at the end of a race will ensure you go off course. So continually think about that goal, put it as a visualization board, have it written down, if it's, a, if it's a goal to, to get, uh, save money to get to a, a vacation spot, have pictures of that. If it's about losing weight, have pictures of that. If it's about ensuring that you have time and, and being able to care for someone in your life, you know, find ways to visualize what it's going to mean when you reach that. So if you get tripped up, why may the goal have failed? 
again, the goal probably was not written down. There was no set rewards for achieving the goal, and that wasn't clear. Maybe, again, the goal was unrealistic or not specific enough. Maybe the goal was not yours to begin with. Maybe the motivation was coming from someone else, and it's very hard to achieve somebody else's goal when it's not what we're wanting to do. Maybe the goal kept changing with no clear direction. Maybe you had no accountability, help, or support. And maybe you had not developed it into a realistic plan with measurements, timelines, and resources. What can we learn from the masters of goal setting? It always feels that when I'm, when I'm setting to, up to do a uh, upcoming uh, webinar that I hear something online on NPR or on another news station that really hits home to what we're talking about. And this session on NPR about Nolan Bushnell, who was both the founder of Atari and Chuck E. Cheese. So we clearly know this is someone who can set goals and achieve them. Um, even though if they, they seem so far apart in terms of um, two such diverse types of businesses. But he certainly knows something about achieving goals and has a u- unique way of actually yearly goal planning at this time in his life. Each year, he makes a list of 11 significant projects he's interested in tackling. They have to be brand new initiatives. It may be about learning something new. Uh, One year he had on his list uh, learning to play the banjo, maybe attempting something he's never done previously. He had several items about um, different hikes around the world that he wanted to be able to achieve. He then numbers each of these, he rolls the dice, and he chooses the three items that the dice state are the ones he's going to work on that year. It's a really unique way of, of thinking about it. It's one first and foremost, allows us to start kind of thinking about what's important to us during that next year and start really kind of looking at all those aspects. Um, And then it really, again, narrows it down. He He is wise enough to know that even though he has these 11 significant projects he's interested in, he knows that it's unrealistic to try to do all of them. But because these are all things that he wants to do, he finds it hard to choose them on their own because one does not have more value to him than the other. One is not more worthy than the other. And so that's his one way of kind of using an external force to uh, help him with, with goal setting. So I thought it was a really interesting kind of action item for, for all of us to take on um, and see if that is one way of, of thinking about some both short-term and, and long-term goals. It's my hope that you enjoyed today's webinar, and if you did, please like us on the Synergy Home Care Facebook page, which allow, will allow you to keep current on all the upcoming webinars, as well as articles about caregiving and seniors. Feel free to email me with any questions at Carla Sutter at SynergyHomeCare.com. And to be added to our email newsletter, go to our website at www.SynergyHomeCare.com. Over the summer, we have two new upcoming webinars. In June 14th, we're going to talk about minimizing risk and enhancing independence with home modifications. There are so many things and and many of these which are free or cost very little money to do in one's home that can really enhance our independence, increase safety, and minimize risk of falls. July 19th, we're going to have a webinar on understanding the stages of Alzheimer's and how the different stages impact caregiving and impact the plan of care we put in place. To learn more about how Synergy Home Care Services can assist you, a client, a patient, or someone you're caring for, please contact us at 1-877-432-2692. If you would like to receive a certificate of attendance after viewing this webinar, please contact us at Carla Sutter at Synergy Home Care dot com.